everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. It is 5 a.m. Yes, 5 a.m. And we're going to call up my good friend, Mr. Mike Arango, because he is on the East Coast, so it's 8 a.m. And he has managed to assemble a lot of rather wonderful people over at Sweetwater, where we're going to go around the store and pick some of our favourite instruments. We're going to cover drums, basses, electric guitars, keyboards, acoustic guitars. We're going to do the whole gamut and we're going to get some top picks from them on entry level, mid price, and then I'm going to ask them all what would be their wish list as well. So this is going to be a fun episode, you know, because at the end of the day, I am really just a guitar player that turned into an engineer and a producer and a songwriter and all of the above. But like all of you, I'm sure, I fell in love with music and I fell in love with playing instruments. So without further ado, let's get on the phone with Mike Arango. Mike, how the devil are you, my friend? Good morning. <laughs> how you been? Good, good, good. I, I want to point out that it is uh, 5 a.m. here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But thank you ever so much for coming in early. Thank all the guys for coming in early. I really, really appreciate it. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. This is quite exciting. I was just saying off camera to, to the guys here, it's fun to talk about recording equipment. And as you know, that's what you and I do every single day is record and talk about recording. Um, but I'm really just a guitar player. I mean, you know, you have to, most people get in, you know, for either playing an instrument, of course, loving music. And this is the most exciting part of it for me, to be honest. Um, I don't get to talk about guitars and basses and drums and keyboards and everything as much as I talk about microphones every day. So I'm, I'm relishing this, even though I did only get four hours sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and, and uh, you're and you're right. You know, my background, I'm, I'm familiar with these instruments and everything. My background is really recording and production. But Sweetwater brings in a ton of people from all over the country and, and really all over the, the the world that are lifelong musicians. And I figured that for this particular video we can shake things up a little bit get some other guys from here involved some of my friends incredible um that are also sales engineers here that are really passionate about their instruments and get them to talk a little bit about some of the value instruments that are out there and, and other options great so look on, on my list of stuff i want to talk about we've got keys obviously we've got acoustic guitars electrics basses drums we can start wherever Please introduce me to, I don't know, let's, let's go. Who, who's your keyboard guy? Let's talk to a keyboard salesman there. Definitely. So I have Josh Katner here. He's going to talk about keyboards. Excellent. Whiskey, lifelong musician, really knows his stuff. We'll get into drums with Ryan Holquist. Um, he plays in a couple bands around town. Uh, does a lot of session drumming for me. So he's familiar with my studio and, and a, a really talented drummer. Uh, Andy Rice is going to talk to you about bass. He's a lifelong bassist, a really talented bassist, and also a talented songwriter. Um, and then Ben Porter, who plays uh, several stringed instruments, uh, primarily guitar. He plays mandolin and a bluegrass band as well. Excellent. Um, so we'll have them talk with you, spend a little time with you, and answer the questions and everything, and uh, you know, hopefully set it up with some good instruments for that studio. All right, we'll start off with keys. I'm going to hand you over to Josh Katner. Hello, nice to meet you. Josh, good to meet you too. How are you this yeah. fine early morning? I am doing swell. I'm a morning person, so... Uh, I love my coffee. <laughs> so doing well. How about you? <laughs> absolutely marvelous. So we're walking um, through the campus now to the keyboard department. Yes, absolutely. I'll turn this around. Walking around, my favorite place of the entire store. Marvelous. So, yeah, absolutely. I have a few keyboards in mind that I always recommend to people wanting to start out. You know, either composing or learning piano in general or wanting to get into synthesis, all of that. So, yeah. I think, I think for me, um, as the dumb guitar player who plays keys out of necessity in production, um, yeah. I think the questions I would probably want to know are like, if I was just going to buy a keyboard for the piano itself, you know, because I still think there's people that want to buy keyboards with like the best piano sound, what you mm -hmm. think that would be. Then, of course, there's the there's the virtual version of a keyboard that has everything on it. it, has drum pads, has, you know, different, you know, remote controls for different parameters that can be set up on virtual instruments and all that stuff. That's a must for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. then I think then, of course, the good old fashioned traditional, you know, comes loaded with the best sounds kind of keyboards, you know. 
Right, right, absolutely. Well, where do you want to start? Why don't we start with the with the piano, with the piano keyboard? What? Yeah. Because I'm sure you get a lot of parents, for instance, like calling up and going, "I want to get something for my son or daughter, you know, to learn learn piano on." Yeah, absolutely. So, a few questions I typically like to ask is: uh, Is it going to be for a child that's learning classical music? Um, is it going to be something that needs headphones? And is it going to be something that they're going to be taking around or is it going to be like a furniture piece? So those typically are questions I ask um, just to make sure that, hey, you know, are we looking at Clavinova? <laughs> that's, you know, right. four or $5,000 that's going to just sit there like when I have a home or are we looking at like a, a Yamaha P125, right? That's going to be something like this, for instance. Um, P125, really good key bed, um, really great sounds. Um, and also with this, you can get a stand that makes it look like a furniture piece, but then you can just pick it straight up and start doing, you know, gigs going out and doing, you know, Isma stuff, which is, um, Indiana's, you know, you take a keyboard in, play Chopin and <laughs> have fun. So this is it is fully weighted? I, is it fully? Yeah, yeah it's, it's fully weighted. Um, and so fully weighted is a little bit of a tricky term. So fully weighted on Yamaha, in my opinion, is going to be one of the better ones because quite frankly, Yamaha is one of the only keyboard companies that also make grand pianos <laughs> that yes. we sell here. Um, and their grand pianos sound amazing. They feel great, feel really smooth. You can do classical, jazz, rock. Uh, I'm a take. Yamaha grand piano owner. So yeah. Oh, um, you are? Yeah. Which one do you have? Well, I had a C7 for years, um, and now I, now I have a C5 in the house. Gotcha. Yeah. Don't don't hate me. The grand piano I have at home is a Baldwin. I love Baldwin. <laughs> so, love Baldwin. And it's because my background is doing film comp, and oh my gosh, the low end on the Baldwin just sounds amazing, especially when you get some Earthworks mics on there. So. But unfortunately, we can't talk about Baldwin grand pianos because they're not making them anymore, are they? Oh, no, not, not at least the American ones. So yeah. mine's from, I think it was the Boston shop um, that was making the Baldwins. But yeah, so, and we don't sell the Baldwins here at Sweetwater either. It's a shame because, yeah, the first Frey record was made on a Baldwin grand piano. And uh, I, did, I did have a Baldwin grand piano. Actually, Mike, no, Mike would have recorded it. Yeah, oh, we really? ha yeah, we had a, we had a, a, a nine-foot Baldwin. You, you recorded a nine-foot Baldwin? We had it at Swing House. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. I would have loved to play that. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're talking about grand. So Yeah, it's, okay. I, think, I think it's called like a concert grand or something like that. It was the huge one they made. And, we, yeah. and basically a piano company gave it to us for storage. And they would, they <laughs> would, whenever it was rented, they would take it away. We had it in the situ for five years. They never used it. Nobody ever hired, rented it. Because it's cool. like, it's for classical and just, you know. Was like one of those things. Absolutely. Anyway, so we so um, how much is that Yamaha you're talking about with the weighted yes. keyboard? So the Yamaha, and I can play a little bit of it too, um, is six ninety nine, um, and for the price you get at really good sampled pianos. You have the option of doing like different e pianos, organs, things like that. If they ever want to expand a little bit for gigging, great key bed. Um, harkens back to Yamaha grand pianos. They use some of the same type of feel from the grand pianos to model these feelings um, transposition a lot of really great options for learning a lot of teachers and parents love this piano because it's really easy to have a kid five years old to you know starting out when you're in your 70s you know sit down have a good feel have a good sound start so, so if that's if yeah. that's why i'm assuming that's kind of it's mid what's the sort of the most entry level which presumably is not going to come fully weighted but the... right yeah so let's go over here real quick so i have a love um for casio actually because casio is my first keyboard way back in the early 2000s um or late 90s i forget when it was um and so we actually have a casio um ct uh series here it's around 500, and then if you want to even get um, lower, there's a Yamaha PSR. But I think the Casio, which is around $500, that's where you're still going to be able to have 
a decent key bed, but a lot of sounds and they have built-in speakers. So it just sounds fun. Great. You can just jump in because we have, you know, quite a few here. CTX 5000. We have the PSR EW310. Um, are all the, are these, are these like the semi-weighted feel now? Yes. So these are going to be semi-weighted. So you're not going to have the feel that's going to jump on, you know, you're going to jump on a upright or a grand or something like that. It's not going to feel the same. So there's going to be some adjustment, which is fine. Um, but that's how they cut some of the costs to make it a little bit less expensive. And also the sounds aren't going to be as pristine as say like P125 or MX88 or something like that. So, so with the P125, for instance, is that that's essentially as close a piano sample as you could ever imagine. Yes, the P125 has some of the best Yamaha samples for that price range that I know of. Um, I've recorded a P125 before and put in some film scores, actually, well, on a pinch. So they, they just sound great. I really love them. Um, I taught on the P125 those to quite a few different kids. So it was just it's really fun. Impromptu, uh, fancy uh, C sharp minor is just great. So, and I played that one on the 125 and it's been really fun. So, yeah. Amazing. Thanks for the, uh, the overview on the pianos. So let's go the other direction. Let's go to um, keyboard controllers. Controllers that can trigger drum sounds as well. So pads built into them, um, you know, uh, varying parameter controls for whatever you want to assign them to. You know, I've, I've seen these days, you know, co companies like Artoria and men I, when I first started, it was like M Audio used to have this like, what's it called? The o Octane or something? The, you remember that keyboard? I don't even know if that's still being made. No, I don't think that's being made. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, at least not that I've sold. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, yeah, like MIDI controllers. Let's go ahead. Um, yeah, so we actually have a few different MIDI controllers, um, like the SL88 or the Key Lab. I actually have a Key Lab um, in my studio right now, um, and I have it hooked up to my complete uh, software and also my East West software. So easy use. Um, I use the pads for quick drums with damage, um, and then I have all the key beds set up for strings, violin, viola, celli, um, contrabass. Um, all of that. And then I actually have um, good old faders and knobs programmed to have different aspects of those strings. So that way I can add them on the fly. So yeah, you have a lot of options. And this keyboard, I believe, is around 449. Um, but you can get the mini lab here from Arturia, which is like $79. So if you really want to just dive in and get started with a DAW, um, the mini lab is absolutely fantastic it is shorter keys so you have a little bit of a tighter time playing but you still have the pads the knobs that are all programmable so that way you can dive into your virtual instruments um, fairly easily so that's fantastic 79 dollars yeah 79 dollars i i remember when i was first getting to film comp and i think it was 08 i had a i came to sweetwater and i bought a uh, M audio keyboard and the only controller that had full 88 keys or all of the pieces I actually needed was like $400 back in 07. <laughs> that was yeah. a lot of money, but there wasn't really, at least from my recollection, a mini lab where I would have bought one because <laughs> I was young. I didn't have any money. My parents didn't have any money. Um, and so, but yeah, $79 to get right into it. You can get $79 and then buy like say studio one um, for studio one artist for $99. And then, get the complete select which i forget how much that is but my gosh you can under 500 dollars, you can get an entire recording set up and have really good sounds you know that's amazing say better sounds than you know a two thousand dollar workstation keyboard so um, that's incredible yeah. any yeah. any other standouts um for midi controllers oh yeah so if you want to invest into like say you're doing um, film comp or you're doing some type of uh, theater composition or orchestral composition and you're a keyboard player, a piano player, quite frankly. The SL88 Grand right down here, absolutely fantastic. Now it comes at a higher price tag of about $1,050, but 
the feel of it is absolutely fantastic for a controller. You have all of the different options to be able to adjust um, your sounds, and then you can also use that as a MIDI controller to go into your DAW and go into your virtual instruments or virtual studio technology um, really, really simply. So um, that's the one I would really say is a standout. If you really want to invest in one, SL88 grand, amazing. But you know what? If you only have the cash to get something for $79, Mini Labs just fine too. I have still tons of those. So. I'm, I'm really impressed with that four five hundred dollar one. I think we mm -hmm. have an Arturia that's like that, but it's an, it must be an older version. But that looks like something we should upgrade to. Yeah, I mean, talk with Mike about it. <laughs> we will. <laughs> so <laughs> we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the Arturia lineup is great. I have uh, three Arturia keyboards at home right now, actually. Well, um, you, I mean, Mike so. must have told you uh, our history. Mike was uh, my engineer like fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. He had mentioned that. And uh, that's incredible. Mike is one of the most intelligent people here. <laughs> I'm not just saying that because he's here, but like he's. <laughs> he, he's I, I, I see. I see him waving money behind you. <laughs> yes, he, yes, he's waving money behind me. To, um, he's going to split me on a big console deal or something. Like that. Um, no, Mike's Mike's been great. So yeah, definitely talk to him about the key lab. Those guys are fantastic. So I suppose the next thing to talk about is to not ignore is good old fashioned traditional hardware keyboards, synths. Do you have any, mm -hmm. uh, any favorites? Oh Lord. Well, my, my favorite is far too expensive. <laughs> it's, well, I still want to know. <laughs> it is the Moog one, um, which is a hefty nine grand. Wow. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. I won't be buying one of those today. Yes. Um, So you have so much in this that if you're interested in, if you have nine grand laying around and you want to have some nope. true analog <laughs> synth, go for it. This is by far one of my favorites. And if I didn't value my marriage, I would buy one. Um, but <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to value my marriage. So, um, but still staying in the mobile line, one of my favorites is the Sub 25, which we actually have right here. Um, it's still, it's $1,200, but it's true analog synth. You have a lot of different options to be able to just bend and create sounds Two oscillators. You have mixer for the oscillator and then you have the filter, um, with resonance, multi-drive and, um, EG amount, KB amount. So, and then also your envelope parameters, the attack, decay, sustain, release, just a lot of really good functions just for a simple, straightforward synth that sounds absolutely bad and amazing. <laughs> yeah. Let's move the frequency up. I could mess around with it for hours. Um, <laughs> Sounds great, even on the phone. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, it's really fun. I love the fact that with like a Moog Sub 25, you have the mixer for the oscillators, and then you have the sub oscillation too, um, and the noise um, in this mixer patch. And it just, oh my gosh, it just adds so much beefiness to it. Like Moog just has this really warm, beefy, silky, huge sound, bigger than life sound that I. I, I use <laughs> all the time and unapologetically. So yeah, amazing. Uh, what other? No, there's there's obviously something incredibly legendary about Moog since. Any other standouts for you? Um, let me see if there's not any standouts that I personally would um, be using right now. But I, there are a few standouts for it if you only have say like three or four hundred dollars. To get into Great. A synth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Roland has these really cool, sort of like the JX08s. Um, let me turn this up. Oh, well, I love that already. I don't know if you can hear yeah. that or not, but it's loud since we got. But yeah, yeah you have, have just this small little guy. guy. LFO, DCO, um, digitally controlled oscillator. 
Um, and then you have the mixer between both of them, just kind of like the same thing with sub 25. And then you have all of your different uh, voltage controlled filters too, which is really fun for $400. You get something that is just absolutely incredible. Um, and the fact that <laughs> it can fit in your backpack, quite frankly, <laughs> is really, it's really cool. Um, then there's also, there's multiple different ones too. There's like the JU, oh, um, 06A. Wow. That's four hundred dollars as well. So it's it's just in, absolutely incredible. So, That's amazing. Yeah. So it, if I were to say, hey, you only have four hundred dollars, look into the the rolling lineup. But I'm I'm also just a rolling geek. I personally own the RD eighty eight for gigs and stuff, and it's just really fun. <laughs> so incredible. Um, yeah, absolutely. Incredible. Well, thank, thanks ever so much for taking us through. Um, <gasps> you know what? One, one, one thing, you know what we should do is like, I do see a Nord behind you. Oh, That's, lordy, the Nord. <laughs> it's it, it's got to be the most used gig and keyboard ever. I, oh whenever I go to see any band, I mean, uh, one of my best friends, uh, Steve, I have a Nord behind me, by the way, here, Steve's Nord. Um, you know, we went to see him play with Toto, and there's two keyboard players on stage, and it's all Nords. It's like, mm -hmm. and, and they've been around now for quite some time, and they've become, I hate the word, but I'm going to use it, phrase, industry standard. Oh, it, it, it's absolutely industry standard. Um, it's kind of funny in the worship world, people say Nord for the Lord as well, because it's so, <laughs> it's like permeated into even the worship side of things and yeah it's just the nord stage three is an iconic um keyboard that i just absolutely love it sounds um absolutely incredible if i can actually play right <laughs> It's, it's just absolutely incredible to play. Um, it feels great. Um, you have so much control. I kind of call it, like at least my wife calls it, um, like the space station keyboard because you just have so much to be able to mold and mix your sound. It, it's, it's truly a beast. Um, comes in, I believe, around 3,500. Uh, no, 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 more than that. The Nord Stage 3 now comes in at like 5,300. I was thinking about the Piano 5, which is right up here, if you wanted just to get the piano sound. So, yeah, it comes around 5,300. But, yeah, it's – geez, Louise. <laughs> yep. I get excited talking about this keyboard. Um, not surprising, right? You know, it's, it's, it's super fun. Also, the sounds, the sounds in it are vast, but also they're not like – you know, with some of the lower end keyboards that you're starting out with, yeah, you have tons of sounds, but sound quality isn't going to be nearly as well because they're going to be modeled versus sample based. A lot of the ones in Nord Stage 3 are sample based. Um, like so for strings, brass, woodwinds, things like that. And then the synth sounds, EPO sounds, organs, even some organs are sample too, just absolutely floors me with how good, even if they are modeled, how good the sounds are. So, like it, it, yeah. it just amazing, absolutely. Amazing. Well, thanks ever so much for taking us through the keyboards. I really, yeah. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Do you um, have any other questions or anything like oh, that? Oh, I'm, sh I'm sure I do. At the end of this, I'll probably be going, oh, I should have asked him this. Thank you ever so much, okay. Josh. I really appreciate it. Okay. Absolutely. Great meeting you. Let's go over to All some right. guitars. All right. Let's walk over to the guitars. Ben, how are you? 
I'm excellent. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Eric is handing me over my LL16, which I uh, I love this acoustic guitar. This, this is yours? Yeah, I have two of them. Yeah. I think Sounds this is great. Honestly, think it's it's the best value acoustic guitar I've ever I've ever owned in my life. It records yeah. so well. Um, yeah, and absolutely I can't beautiful. See, is that a dreadnought or what size? Yeah, it's the Yamaha LL16. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Absolutely love this guitar. So um, let's let's sort of go through the, the the an entry model value for money acoustic that 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 you recommend that really does well okay. for you guys and people absolutely love? So I'm actually a lover of Yamaha in that kind of entry to mid-level. In fact, um, this guitar right here, this trans acoustic, is a wonderful guitar. I love this. So it's like 700 bucks. So that's probably, right. I don't know, that's under a thousand, but it's a solid top. It actually has that built-in reverb, which is a oh, lot yeah. of it, but some people like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, and um, man, honestly, also the gills, like this dreadnought, it's like seven hundred dollars. is lovely, like that. It just it's rich, like you want a dreadnought to be. Kind of wraps, you know, the tone wraps around you. It's got, you know, nice highs and. How much is that's that? A lot it, of guitar. How much is the the guild, and what's the model number of it? So this one here is the D one forty. It just has the burst. Um, and this solid top, you know, like, and and we've talked about this before, but at this price point now for 700 bucks, you're getting a lot of guitar. And it's a solid top. And this sounds like a real guitar that you could, you know, record with or play with. Back when I, even when I was a kid, like, you didn't get much until you spent a lot more, you know? Yeah. Solid and, top at $700 is fantastic. Yeah. 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 And both of these are. And that, so back to that Yamaha, the trans acoustic, that's a solid top. And in the Yamaha line, we're at 700, which is a really great place to jump in. But there's actually, there are Yamaha models for three and four and 500 that I think are completely usable and are way better than my first guitar. Right. Yeah, you know? it's on. And then if, if there was no, um, if budget was not an issue, what would you get? Well, that's fun. And it depends <laughs> on the day of the week. Um, Triple O 28 in the Martin line is a wonderful guitar. It's kind of like that Taylor 814, right? Which is like, it's small, it's the Grand Auditorium or triple O size. So it's not as boomy as a Dreadnought, but still has some nice low end, you know, great for finger picking, good for flat picking. And so depending on what flavor, like if you're a Taylor guy, you might be looking at, like, well, like A14 is their flagship. Um, but that, that four body shape, the Martin line, the triple O 28, and check this out. For a thousand seventy nine, I just played this this morning. Gibson has a G forty five. It's still made in Bozeman, still made in America. That thing's sounds it? great. Yeah. So, and check that out. It has that little uh, oh little wow hole. But like, it doesn't have much fancy binding, right? It's real simple, but it's all real wood and it's made in America, and it sounds great. So. Yeah. Amazing. And then what about, this is actually a bit of a left, uh, do you, what would you recommend in a sort of travel small guitar? I have a Martin Baby guitar. Um, I never bought um, the, the, the one that looks like a cricket bat. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, in those travel guitars, is there any, uh, anything new happening there? Because there was a Taylor one was, as well, wasn't there? A little Taylor Baby yeah. one? Yeah. There are some, and honestly, I mean, mostly we move Taylors and Martins, and usually you would just make that decision, you know, based on, like, the family sound. You know, if you're a Taylor guy and you like a little brighter, then you get the Taylor one. And they sound nice. I mean, they're obviously a little thin because the body's so small. The, you know, the tone is a little thinner, but they, don't, they sound pretty good. You know? what's, the, what's the starting price for, like, a little tight, especially if you've got a young child, you know, for somebody who wants yeah. to buy a small guitar, where, where do they really start so like, off at? This is like 345. Oops, here we go. So that's that's a Taylor. So we've got the actual baby Taylor, which is 449. And that's climbing up because, you know, if you have a child, I have children. I, I don't necessarily spend four or 500 bucks on every one of them 
on every instrument, you know? And so we do have some models below that, but ideally, if you can, you'd want to get up to a baby tailor, you know, um, so you're not buying a new guitar, you know, in a year. But right, if you're worried right. your kid's going to quit, you know, and or not stick with it, then you might say, hey, what's like a $100 guitar, you know? And in that case, it's not going to, you know, it's not really about the tone. You just need to get a guitar for your kid to get going, you know? Yeah, yep, understood. The, you know, the passion, the love of the music. And... Um, are, you, are you also going to be taking us through electrics? Yeah, yeah let's go there Okay, now. let's go and check out some electrics. And now there are many, many, many guitars in here. So many. Wow. And where do you want to start? Well, I mean, I've got, I've got an absolute massive love. Again, it's Yamaha, uh, and no, they, they don't, they're not sponsoring me. But the Revstar is my personal favorite electric guitar at the moment. And yeah. what I love about this guitar um, is, I thought when I got this guitar that it was the Japanese, you know, top of the range one. And I was playing it on a live stream and somebody asked me, what model is it? So I flipped it over and I go, oh, it's an RSE 20. And then they were like, you can buy that at Sweetwater for $499. And yeah. this is my yeah, favorite yeah. guitar. We actually yesterday tracked uh, a cover and we had a good friend of mine, Michael Humphreys, who's an amazing jazz player come down and he soloed on it and loved it. And it's a $500 guitar. On the $500 guitar. Yeah. Yeah. It's a whole different yeah. world. It's such a great. It is. I mean, it's so great. Even down to the Squires and all the stuff they've been doing with these new um, Paranormals and all these kind of anniversary editions, those are nice. You could make music. I mean, I mean, you could be in a band and play a Squire. These are solid. And right. how much? So like, um, you can get a Squire down a couple hundred bucks. So like this Tele is like two thirty three. Really? And then the ones wow. that are kind of fancy, like here's. You know, they'll do like special colors and all that. Now you're getting up into like three to five hundred. Like here's a paranormal squire. It's like four seventy, which is high for a squire traditionally, right? They were super low end, but now they're they're dolling them up and they I mean, look at this thing, it's cool. Wow, it's, it's a thin P90s. line as well. It's a thin line, the color's nice, it's got the matching headstock. It's incredible. It's a fun guitar, you know, and so yeah, I think you're totally right. Like any one of these guitars that I see in this room under a thousand bucks for sure, even is going to be great. I would recommend any one of these. Um, what are your personal favorites? I personally love tellies and hollows, hollow bodies. Right. And so I was just playing a player telly here a moment ago and um, it's affordable. It's under a thousand bucks. It's lovely. You know, um, we have a Fender Tullys and Strats and then also a GNL. So some people like that as an option. And I played this yesterday. Here's a GNL Tully for 530. It plays great. It sounds lovely. Um, and then Hollows is my other favorite. And I personally own a Gretsch and a Guild Starfire. I oh, love. I love Guild Starfires. Yeah. 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 I have a 63 so Guild Starfire. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember finding out that Cake, the band, that guitarist, he used um, that. I never knew. But at one point, I found out, and I always loved his tone. That's not why I bought the Starfire. I was like, yeah, that's so cool. I love that tone. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, a one, wonderful guitar. I absolutely love it. Very underrated. Yeah. Very, very underrated. Yeah. It is. And it has a, a very thin neck. You know, probably one of the thinnest necks of any hollow I've ever played. And for some people, like me, I don't mind. I'm like, okay, that's easy. It's easier to play. But sometimes that will be, you know, that will be an issue. If someone's looking for, like, the baseball bat ES335 thing, you know, that sure. they have to know that about the old Starfire. It's a thin neck. Yeah, that, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what about Shredder? 
What about for the shredders? What, uh, give us a little, uh, you know, give us a little background on some shredding there. So what's the sort of entry level for somebody getting in, they want a shredding guitar that has the humbuckers, uh, maybe with a coil tap as well, and you know, whammy bar. What are, okay. we, what are we looking at price-wise? So, I mean, for 500 bucks, really close, we're talking 539, we can get you into an LTD. And this is a Speed Demon, as it were. So we got a tremolo, locking nut, all the usual suspects. Beautiful top, bunch of pick, you know, the pickup configurations for splitting and single and humbucker. And there's LTD has a lot of affordable guitars. Um, and PS on our website, it's really easy to see what we have. This year, that's important just because it's been hard to get stuff. But when you look at any category, you can hit the in stock button. And in right. that moment, you're just going to be shown the ones that we have. That's a good idea. Um, yeah. Which is kind of nice because we get, you know, you might be looking on there and fall in love with a guitar that isn't due for a year. But uh, you'll notice on our website, there's tons of options. But I would start in the LTD camp personally. Although, I mean, Jackson and Ibanez also have good guitars in that price range. They've definitely created a lot of models that are under 500 and for sure under 1,000. You know? Beautiful. And under 1,000, I know I. Uh, I saw a lot of these Schecter Hellraisers, the C1, and that's a beautiful guitar. I mean, it's got EMGs and check out like this, the uh, the binding. It's pretty, and then Schecter has all the different flavors. So if you want like flat black, or if you're more into like the gloss black, it has a lot of finish options. Um, they're very affordably priced. Very cool. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so last but definitely not mean, no means least, um, let's give a little uh, love to PRS. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, beautiful made guitars. Um, did I see some in the background? There they are. Yeah. Gorgeous. So... I, I have that white one. I have that Vela. Um, oh, yeah. that, one of my favorite guitars. It's, talk okay. about, th you want to talk about skinny necks? That yeah. one's, yeah. That's like playing butter as it were. <laughs> It's yeah. just They're so nice easy so to play. Playable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first time I played a PRS, even before I owned one, it, like I picked it up and it felt like I had played it for years. But literally, it just felt like an old friend. And I don't even remember what neck it was. It didn't really matter. It just felt great. And I feel that way with all their necks, really. Um, so we've got PRS has SD models, which are very affordable, meaning like under a thousand bucks in their line. And they're made overseas, but they're QC here in their U.S. building, in the same building where you know they make the U.S. models. And so SC at this point makes a hollow body. Um, you can do like a custom 24, you know, with a beautiful top. It's gorgeous. See that? Yeah. Eight hundred dollars. You know. Yep. My good friend Matt Lang um, has a, a handful of uh, PRSs and. He has one SE that's his main guitar, and he also oh, has yeah. a lot of really expensive ones. You know, I, 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 I remember when I was a kid when Squires were, you know, a lot newer. Um, Frank uh, Dunnery, Francis Dunnery, who played with Robert Plant and had a band called It, it Bites, was a phenomenal guitar player. His main yep. guitar was a Squire. I think it's just really important for us to remind people that yeah. a guitar is a guitar. Somebody just pick it up, you play it, you think it's beautiful, you open your eyes to the price and realize, like I did with the Revstar, this is, you know, price isn't always an indicator. And for us as guitar players, it's always the feel, isn't it? How does this feel in your hands? Yeah, exactly. And the pickups, the pickups and the lower models have gotten really good. So when you plug in a, a, a more affordable guitar, it sounds good. Yeah. You know, it doesn't sound muddy and uh, thin, which are a lot of times issues with cheap pickups traditionally. Yeah. They sound a microphonic, nice. yeah. And really, yeah. when I was a kid, the cheap guitars were just like feedback. Like almost right, right. immediately put any gain on them. They didn't have any body, you know. It, yeah. yeah. And the first yeah, thing you do is clarity. Yeah. 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 First thing you do is always like upgrade the hardware and stuff. But yeah. 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 For sure. And and then we've got PRS with some models now in the mid mid price range. Like these S2s are fifteen hundred dollars. And then, of course, for whoever wants it, there are the museum quality guitars. Really. Oh, they're with unbelievable. The tops. Yeah. I mean, they're just unbelievable. 
and then they go all the way up to artist editions and customs and it can be as fancy as as one would hope yeah. so before we move on we've got to talk about you know got to talk about gibson when you're talking about electrics you've obviously got the les paul you've got sgs but for me growing up it was always joe pass on a 175 and of course bb king and larry colton on yes. 335s so 335s. absolutely gorgeous um what do you have in there at the moment so right now we've got some up here on the top shelf so gorgeous. black 335 which is kind of interesting here's one all black black pick guard Here's a more traditional, is the gold with the tortoise shell. And then even over here, I guess we like black 335s today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I do like that sunburst as well. That's gorgeous. Yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. I, 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 I'm really impressed with their current stuff. I was playing a brand new one the other day, and I used to have a 68 and a 72... I sold all those when I moved to America from England. I sold a lot of my guitar collection. And gotcha. and uh, and the new one played just like I remember the old ones. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's a tone you don't get out of a, you know, out of a solid body. That's you got to have some hollows or semi-hollows. That's, that's Amazing. something we all want in the collection for sure. Amazing. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much. If we can uh, go over and talk basses, that would be amazing. That's lovely. Here we go. Thank you. Andy, how are you? Hey, you go. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I feel like today I'm a walking uh, Yamaha advert. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because I, I, th this uh, BB, uh, which model is it? I don't even remember that. Oh, yeah. Is that one of those like old PJ, the vintage looking style ones? No, I, I, maybe. It's, it, it's, uh, I, I got it new maybe three or four years ago now. And cool. it's like 600 bucks. Nice. It might have gone up a little bit. Um, and it's also active. Oh, nice. So it's ridiculous. So it's got all these different sounds. It's made in Indonesia, but it sings. Yeah. It's just yeah, beautiful. Yeah, you know, I, this has been a bit of theme of today's uh, video is just like how incredible, you know, instruments are now at a fraction of the cost of when I was a kid. And yeah. you can make records on guitars and basses at like five or six hundred dollars. Yeah. Not a problem at all. So what, what are some of your recommendations at the sort of entry level? Something that you think somebody would buy and it would last them a few years, not something they would buy and then want to chop in and, you know, within a year. Right. Well, my main go-to is like there's the Squire vintage modified series. Um, oh no, sorry. They're called classic vibes. This like this guy right here. Great. J bass. These are like really good for the dough. The P bass, they have like a fifth, um, a sixties P bass. That's like, you know, Jamerson on a budget, throw some Labella flats on it, and you're, you know, you're there. You're in like Pino. Beautiful. <laughs> you know, Pino Palladino. Jim of course. Jamerson territory, you know. So I love both those players. How much is that one? Oh, that one, the jazz bass, that one's like 450 So 449 And I think the P bass equivalent's the same thing. Yeah, really great instruments to the dough. Like the fretwork is surprising. And I mean, they're, they're heavy like fenders tend to be, but like it's, you know, it's great for the dough. They're killing. Wonderful. And then the next step up, what's your sort of mid-price pick? Um, probably like the player series stuff. I'm looking to see if we have any here. The, the Fender player series stuff or even like um, uh, G&L's got some tribute stuff too. Oh, there's the player series stuff, man. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Yeah, you get, so there's like, you know, they have like short scale, like Mustang PJs. So if somebody's oh, like nice. a guitar player and they don't like the full scales, like kind of just too much then, you know, and it's got the two pickups. So you've got some versatility and they've got, you know, P bass and jazz bass offerings in that series too. So, I mean, those Incredible. are the dough too. Yeah. And the G&L tribute series too, which I don't think we have any in here, but those are pretty awesome as well. And then if there was a, you, you had unlimited budget, whatever you wanted. What have you got there that would fulfill that for you? Oh, it's hanging on the wall. Good. Right here. 
Yeah, Music Man, Stingray. I mean, we've got some uh, some nice Warwicks in here too. But I'm like, yeah, Stingray is kind of like the uh, holy grail for me. It is. Is that your? Do you have a Stingray at home? Is that your I main do, base? Yeah, yeah. My daily driver. Cause I play upright and electric too. So my daily driver lately has been this five string Music Man uh, Stingray. Love it. Yeah. Gorgeous. How, how much is that bass? Oh, that one is. Uh, 24, 2400. I mean, for, for, for a wish list, top of the range base, $2,400 is uh, quite affordable. I know lots of people are going to be watching going, what? But I mean, $2,400. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I have cheap taste too, so I don't know. <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, I'm going to guess that one of your favorite bass players is, what, is one of mine. That's Tony Levin. And he's a. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's a music man guy. And I, yeah. I don't. He's my favorite bass player by far. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, just because okay. the creativity, the not just the fact that his lines are beautiful, it's just, the, you know, the way he searches out tone and just creates yeah. the craziest sounds. Um, right. Yeah. His pocket's out of control, too. It's Insane. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I've seen him play with Crimson a couple of times, and it's just yeah. mind-blowing Same. how good he is. Same. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, what, what other bases do you have at home? I'd be interested to see... Um, well, I've got a, I've got a German upright, a P bass, a jazz bass and a music man. That's, I'm pretty basic in that way. Just kind of like the greatest hits kind of. No, but it's good. I mean, that covers yeah. all, it covers all the sounds. Yeah. covers all the sounds. And one thing we haven't talked about, cause we've been making this about instruments, but, um, I think it's good for, for bass. Do you have a solves all the problems session bass amp? Uh, an amp that you think would just maybe do the, the regular gig, but also you could turn up to a session in. What, do you have a recommendation yeah, yeah. for that? Oh, yeah, for sure. This, I mean, there's a ton of great amps out there. And I'm personally uh, a Galen Kruger guy. I'm like, I've got three different Galen Kruger rigs now. So I'm always like a big fan of their stuff. But this, um, there's a boss amp, this little, um, these Katana amps. They're like yeah. the, um, yeah, they're like the, the bass amp. They've been making those Katana, Katana guitar amps for a while. Um, the bass amps are super cool because they're like three different amps in one. There's an SVT sound in there. There's a modern, uh, more like Eden, SWR, GK kind of flavor in there. And there's also a super flat flavor. And there's a couple game stages you can play with too. So if you're on the SVT setting, you can like hit the front end and get some saturation if you wanted to. Or you could just run it in clean. There's a DI on the back that can be pre or post the amp. And you can also mic it so you can get a DI off it plus the amp sound. But yeah, I mean, and that what- thing's kind of... The Swiss Army knife kind of thing. And what do they run at price wise? Uh, there's a one ten that's like four hundred bucks, and then there's a two ten that's six fifty. That's great. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. And you think that will cover all the bases? Doing a session, doing a small gig, everything. Yeah, the two ten will do a small gig easy. The one ten probably depends on the gig. It's a little small for that, but definitely studio worthy for sure. Amazing. Well, yeah. thanks ever so much. Yeah, man. Moving on to drums now. Thanks for having me on the show. It's cool. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Hello. Hey, Warren. How are you? I'm good. How the devil are you? (laughs) I'm doing well. It's good to meet you. It's good to be met at this fine hour of the morning. Uh, We just... uh, we just, I, was about, I just said to these guys, I was like, this is the time I normally wake up. Now it's 6.30. So the, <laughs> don't usually wake up a couple of hours before this, but uh, this is fun. So we're going to get to talk about drums. Yeah, we're here with Sweetwater Drum Room, which has a little bit of everything. Pretty, uh, pretty noisy space once the day gets rolling. Oh, I can imagine, especially when people are trying out cymbals. Oh, like ah. (laughs) So um, the questions we've been sort of generally asking everybody is the entry level, not necessarily like the cheapest way in, but like the best value entry level. So somebody hasn't got a lot of money to spend, but they're not just going to buy something and then come back a year later and chop it in and get something new, something that maybe will take somebody through the first two to three years of their development. Yeah. Well, I really think, I mean, depending on the size of the studio and the location, if you have the ability to make noise. Um, yep. Uh, obviously, mics cost money, but maybe you can, I know you've done videos on two and three mic configuration and all that. It's pretty good 
Yes. Uh, pretty easy to get a good sound with just a couple mics. Uh, so uh, an acoustic kit to me is the ideal situation. Um, and what, what's the sort of entry level, but re good quality um, kit that you would recommend? Uh, here's a PDP concept maple. Um, it goes for around, depending on the configuration of the kit, uh, eight to $900. Uh, that's not going to include hardware and cymbals. Um, but uh, if you're a drummer, you may already have those things, but don't want to use your gigging kit in the studio or something. Um, and if you have a drummer in, that person is very likely going to bring cymbals and probably a snare drum. Um, so I think starting off with good solid shells. So these are actual maple ply shells rather than sort of cheap chipped up plywood that's going to not only not last as long, but not hold, uh, hold tune as well, not have as pure of a tone and be as versatile and controllable. Um, these are available in a lot of configurations too. So if you're really trying to be versatile, something with like a 20 inch bass drum will help you cover a jazz spectrum up to a rock spectrum. If right. If you're the player, you probably have a, a genre preference that'll dictate the sizes. But uh, so PDP manages to make relatively inexpensive drums by uh, the hardware is a little less beefy, but it's still good enough to hold pitch, uh, right. be controllable. And, and then, not collapse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you, you know, you can drop them. You can, you know, they're very durable. They're just fewer cosmetic options and uh, just a little less, a uh, little less of an intensive now, process. What about symbols? Is uh, I presume every major symbol manufacturer makes like a a combo pack where you get uh, hats and ride and crashes and stuff in one. Is there yeah. an entry kind of level one that you you recommend? Well, symbols are the one thing you really can't fake. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot of inexpensive like two, three hundred dollar symbol packs that are. Um, to me, on a recording, you can tell a cheap cymbal way faster than you can tell a cheap snare drum, especially when you swap out heads and tune well and mic well. But cymbals, uh, you know, in a studio setting where you're trying to get the sound as pure as possible, cheap cymbals sound like cheap cymbals. So, yep. um, so something like uh, uh, Sabian makes the F XSR line. Uh, they're made in the same style of the same materials as their higher end, fewer options. That's generally a good good way to get quality is remove bells and whistles and options, but keep the same process. So uh, those are some favorites. There's some box sets. Uh, you can also start with a small box set. And then like Wuhan has, they're famous for their, their China symbols, but they actually have a lot of pretty nice sounding crash symbols and ride symbols and hi-hats. Um, so you get a good quality drum kit, good shells with good heads. You can really change the character of the drum kit pretty completely by swapping out cymbals. So if you get something sort of form a good bass line and then like getting a new pedal or getting a new uh, different microphone or compressor, uh, a new cymbal can really change things pretty dramatically. How much is the um, is that entry level uh, symbol kit that you were talking about? Uh, depending on the configuration, they're about four hundred to seven hundred dollars, um, which is still a pretty good deal considering a decent uh, a decent ride symbol on its own is three to four hundred dollars. So uh, the packs are definitely a bargain. Uh, unfortunately, just like everything else we've been talking about, this stuff's not cheap. Um, but really you can keep it pretty reasonable, uh, quality wise, uh, pretty, pretty good stuff at reasonable prices available these days. I think, uh, my recollection when I was a kid, it was like you, you bought what you could afford and then you just chopped and changed, you know, you, yeah. you um, I do remember some of the cheaper hats lasting longer than the cheaper crash symbols, you know? Yeah. I think you can get a more convincing sound out of a cheap pair of hi-hats too. 
Yeah. Um, just the larger they get and hi-hats rarely ring out. So uh, you just hear the tinniness pretty quickly, but in a hi-hat, uh, it's still common to use like a, a cheap bottom symbol and a nicer top symbol just to get a little bit of more top end out of it. So, yeah, but um, yeah, but a very cheap, very harsh crash symbol is probably one of the first things to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, you can probably buy the cheapest pawn shop drum kit in the world. Um, and if you kind of know how to massage it a little and get a good sound, I would rather advise someone to do that, even though it's my job to sell music gear to people. Um, yep. You know, if they have a drum kit lying around, just get good heads on it, maybe change out some of the tension rods if they're rusty and sticky or something. Um, and then dump all your money into nice cymbals. Because uh, on a recording, that's really going to, that seems to be you know, the separating the boys from the men kind of thing on a home recording, especially. Uh, the Absolutely. Drums in general. But also the cymbals, uh, that's, a, that's a struggle a lot of the time. Now, if if I'm a parent and I'm calling in and I want to get my child their first kind of drum kit and they're not a musician, they're really just going to be at your mercy. So what do you recommend maybe, because the PDP, like we were talking about, doesn't come with hardware. Um, is there a solution maybe in the thousand dollar, get your, get your son or daughter a kit? which comes with everything with like the, the symbols, the hardware, and of course, all of the shells. Yeah. Is that something you recommend? Uh, the Yamaha stage custom, um, comes in, I think it's eight ninety nine. Um, the symbols aren't going to be the best, but for, again, a, a kid who's starting to learn, uh, those are going to do pretty well. Uh, Pearl. So that's has, everything. So eight ninety nine symbols, stands, shells, the, the works. Yeah. Pearl has some that are even less expensive. Uh, I think they're four ninety nine, five ninety nine. Wow! Um, so, again, they're going to be smaller, much cheaper woods, much less significant hardware. The rims and the lugs, and all all of which, in a recording setting, affects the the pitch and the tone of the drum. But yeah, for a beginner, um, far better right. than pop right, well, Okay, so gun to your head. You know, because what you're talking about, which of those options is going to be the option where it's easier to upgrade? Meaning, is it the Yamaha, the shells are going to last a lot longer than maybe, I don't mean as in quality, I just mean technically sound better. So you're just going to swap out the symbols. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's, what, do you, what would you recommend in the, in the beginner kind of area there? Yeah, probably a... a... Stage Custom, Yamaha. Um, I mean, when I was eight, I bought a used Pearl drum kit that was... At eight? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was a real prodigy. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and I got this used drum kit that was before they had series, and it was really cheap, didn't look great. It had, I think, lived in a bar and had smoke stain. It was white, so you could see all the stains. And, um, and I played that kit through college wow um and i it wasn't because i couldn't afford something else or didn't want something else i just knew i really learned how to control it and how to sort of drive that car um and so putting up different heads maybe buying an additional drum here and there to morph with the style so i think again maybe maybe not the best position for a salesperson but cheap drums with good heads. And then again, like you said, focus on whether it's for improving the sound or the quality or just for variety and versatility, uh, different or more cymbals, bigger or smaller high toms or lower floor toms. Amazing. Uh, and then a snare drum collection, you know, can be like a, an overdrive pedal collection for a guitarist. Like. Okay, then that's a, that's a nice little direction. Now for me, you know, I, I'm going to use this word again, or this phrase again for the second time today. I feel like a supraphonic is is the sort of industry standard. It's the snare drum that most of us will know because of, you know, all of the obvious reasons like Zeppelin, the Beatles and everything using Ludwig kits. Um, yep. What are they running at these days, a supraphonic? Uh, about 500 bucks, uh, depending on size. That'd be for a uh, five and a half by 14. Right. Um, 
And then that, like a lot of industry standards, like a tube screamer or, you know, all these things that have been copied, uh, every other manufacturer makes a superphonic. There's a lot of X factor in those things. Um, there's something about the superphonic that just has the sound. It'll do anything. Um, high, low, muffled, exactly. uh, open. Um, but again, there are a lot of imitations for two or 300 bucks. Like Tama has their SLP line that in that line, they basically copy the, the world's most popular snare drums at a lower price. Uh, even DW in the collector series, which are pretty high end drums with great hardware and throw off. And, uh, they make like a black beauty and a superphonic, and they're actually generally about a hundred bucks cheaper than some of the Ludwig options. Oh, so, wow. Um, yeah. And it can be this wall behind me it can be a dangerous thing. It's ca that's uh, a gorgeous looking wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So what is the Black Beauty these days off the top of your head? Do you remember? I think it's six or seven hundred dollars. Right. Um, and these may be pre-inflation prices. Uh, That's okay. In my head, but um, but yeah, the DW I looked just yesterday is at least a hundred bucks cheaper for a like a, an eight by 14 Black Beauty, which is kind of the, you know, a rock beast of a drum. Uh, That's incredible. Both, I mean, I'm sure if you put two of them next to each other, the DW and the Ludwig, you would hear some differences, but you would also hear probably differences between two different drums. It's just impossible to tune two drums exactly the same or, um, you know, understood. Like entirely. Yeah. Okay. So now it's, now it's, now it's the, uh, if you didn't have to worry about budget, just you personally. What would be your what would be your shells? What would be your symbols? What would be your snare and your hardware? Uh, yeah, for the drums, probably DW collectors. They do a lot of great finishes and um, their hardware and just the build quality without being bulky. Um, just love their stuff. And they have just a one of the newer companies. They've been around for forty or fifty years, but still newer compared to Ludwig and Gretsch and all those. Um, and they just kind of have a, a, a good philosophy on, uh, manufacturing and, you know, drums have been around since, you know, since fire was discovered. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing that you can just incrementally step-by-step step, improve what started as like a hollowed out log with an animal skin stretched over it. Uh, so just little things, hardware, uh, consistency of the heads and uh, all these little tweaks dw really pushes a lot of those so for you does that cover everything that covers the shells the snare and the hardware you would go with dw yeah definitely the shells uh snare drum there's nothing like I mean, it's like having you know pick your favorite shirt i guess you could but that doesn't mean you'd want to wear it every day um I, like you said a superphonic um, I have a DW Black Beauty that does just about everything. Um, I would be very happy to have everything all DW, uh, but I also probably wouldn't live very long uh, with just the, the one snare drum. Variety is great. Like a uh, Ludwig Acrolyte has a sound that... Lovely Acrolyte, yeah. The, the Black Beauty just can't do. So um, So I, I would be very happy with the DW snare uh, and am happy with the couple I own, but... I would also probably want to want to explore hardware. DW is just like the technology and stuff behind development of the shells. Uh, just little things that are individually not a huge deal, but they just do enough of them in terms of adjustability and uh, being durable without being heavy. And uh, they just hardware there. There are a lot of players who maybe play a different brand of shells, but play DW hardware as well. So they're kind of a, kind of hold their own just in that as well. Okay, then symbols. You've got, you can buy any symbols in the world. What would you have? Um, if I was trying to, it was like a desert island thing where I could only have one set of symbols for the rest of my life. Yep. Probably Zil Zildjian Ks. Um, they cover a lot of ground. They're not too dark, not too bright. Um, but for like a, a 
play a lot of gigs as like a jazz trio. Um, so I like really dry cymbals for that. Um, again, in winter, you need a coat. In summer, you need a tank top. So um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> need a little bit of everything. But yeah, Zildjian Ks, they kind of cover a lot of ground. Um, they're, they're good on everything. They sound great recorded. They project well live. Yeah. So electronic drums, do you have those handy you can show us? We do, yep. Um, electronic drums to get one, if you're an acoustic player and you want it to translate really well to an, an electronic kit, it's not a cost saving endeavor. Um, you're going to spend three or $4,000 to get a, like a Roland high end kit that performs or responds as close to an acoustic, particularly snare drum and like ride cymbal hi hats as possible. Uh, for a home studio, like your bedroom studio that you're in now, you may not have room for a full uh, acoustic kit. Uh, might not be high enough ceilings to get a good overhead position, all that. Um, so electronic kits on the lower end definitely serve their purpose. Noise levels, um, space, you can fold a lot of the smaller kits up and put them in a closet or under a bunk bed or something. Um, so... To me, they're not the ideal scenario, but when the situation is right, they're an amazing solution. Incredible. Um, is there an entry level for the for the person that just wants a, a kit to practice on? Uh, what's the you know, but has a limited budget? Is there something you'd recommend? Yeah, I mean, the, Roland has a pretty concise line. They make this TD one. And it's going to be the one you're going to fold up and put in the closet. Uh, things like the snare drum response, they're all small pads, the feel of them, small cymbals. Uh, you can see on this kit, there's no actual hi-hat stand. Oh, and there's, wow. no actual, there's no actual pad. There's no actual drum for the bass drum. Um, so playing drums, a lot of it is the, you know, if you grew up playing acoustic drums, the feedback, the kick drum, just that you're hitting a mass of weight in front of you and you comes flying back at you hitting a little four inch square pad doesn't give you that same satisfaction not in a barbaric way just in a you know like playing a, a travel guitar or something same same deal for a guitar to take in a suitcase great but um, it's just not the same experience um, and then so that kit that td1 is 650 um, this one is the TD7. It's got a bit larger pads, a little more realistic from the muscle memory physical side. Uh, it has an actual hi-hat stand, the hi-hat that opens and closes. A little more significant of a kick drum pad. Um, a lot in a studio setting, a lot of people will use these to trigger something like Easy Drummer or Superior Drummer. Um, and so that can be that can be great for a a home studio, uh, you know, especially if you're an engineer who's not a drummer, you can kind of fake it through and then do a lot of editing and all that. But um, if you're going to be playing the sounds live or multi-tracking, again, you have to go to the top of the line, which is going to be three or four thousand dollars at the smallest kit configuration to have like uh, multiple outputs, outputs for each instrument. Um, so for recording. You may want that for mixing purposes. At that point, you may as well use it as a MIDI controller for Superior Drummer. Um, right. Which, which, which again, I think is not necessarily yeah, that's... Not going to be that much cheaper. Uh, it's, to me, electronic drums are not worth doing for a cost saving. Sure. They're, they're, they're for a they're, noise reason, to be quite blunt. I mean, yeah. The ability to be able to practice drums at, in, at night, in the morning, uh, in, in daytime when you've got neighbors and you're living in a small yeah. apartment, yeah it's, yeah, it's it's a convenience thing, yeah. Yep. And what about, you know, while we're on this, practice pads? Yeah, have... I mean, for a, a beginner, depending on, everyone's different. Uh, there's, it kind of sucks all the fun I was saying about that energy that a drum kit throws back at you when you hit it 
a practice pad is none of that intentionally. I mean, it strips away all the distraction and it's just for your hands. Um, so it takes some discipline or it takes a disciplined child to want to spend any time on it. But those who have the, have the discipline, there's nothing like stripping away all the distraction. You're not going to play along with a record uh, on a practice pad. Um, so yeah, a good practice pad. Uh, portability can be a thing. Uh, a lot of them will fit on a snare drum stand. Um, having it at a good level, you know, if you're not sitting at a level where you would reasonably play, it's kind of bad for your, your posture and all that. But um, the brand Artom makes some nice ones that are like a super quiet. And it's, uh, it's an old drum practice to practice on a pillow for the lack of rebound. It makes your hands stronger. So this uh, okay. is of some sort of, it's similar to like a moon gel uh, right. material. So it has no rebound and it's pretty silent. So I actually have one at my desk that doesn't annoy my, my surrounding cubicles. So, uh, so, so betw between, uh, between calls, you're doing practicing paradils, but dip up to mostly just getting out the nervous energy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I remember at school that was uh, you could always differentiate the drummers because they'd be sitting there, you know, with pencils and cases yeah. and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, my, my my fingers on the bottom side used to have some some red marks from I wanted to do like long drum fills across the whole desk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's the drummer's lot. Well, thanks yeah. ever so much. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, this 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 has been. Uh, this has actually been quite interesting for me because I'm, I'm a terrible drummer. Um, I, I, I play, Eric will tell you, the only time I play is when, when I'm stuck. Where we're like, we can't get a drummer to come in and I'll just go in and play it. And I'll play it like once or twice and then edit myself together. That's how bad I am. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's an area I love. I think, I, I, you know, I, trust me, I love guitars as a guitar player, but there's something about drums because as a recording engineer, recording drums is like the most fun because you can yeah. do the most with it. I would say drums is the most dynamic of all instruments. I can set up a drum kit and put the world's greatest drummer on it and get the best tone and the best sounds, and then somebody else can come in and you'll feel like you're starting all over again. It's the way a drummer hits the drums. There's so many variables. You know, I love guitar playing, don't get me wrong, but if I plug uh, a, a, a strat into a distortion pedal into an amp that's overloaded and go crang and then give it to you. It might go crang slightly differently, but yeah. the difference is negligible. You on a snare drum, me on a snare drum sounds like two completely different spheres. It's there's not even close. So drums are yeah. very fascinating for me for a recording engineer. It's the most exciting thing because you can manipulate and get so many different sounds and feels out of a drum kit compared with probably pretty much any other instrument except for the human voice. Yeah. Well, it's always a debate in a home studio. I, as a drummer, have a drum kit that I just keep in my home studio. It's always mic'd up. It's always fairly well tuned. So I have to do very little tweaking when I want to go play. Um, but that's always me playing it. And you're right, if I had a buddy over to play a track, we'd probably need to swap out some things and retune. So at that point, you might as well start from not scratch, but you might as well rebuild the kit for the player. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of a lot of what you would have in a studio might depend on if you're the player or not. I mean, yeah, the way the way you play a kick drum is so such a mm -hmm. massive variation. I've worked with drummers that have beautiful control and can do this so that you get the attack when they hit it, but you also get the doom. And then a lot of rock drummers, modern rock drummers, just lay, lay the beater into it and you just get that, that, that. And it's okay if you're doing like really fast stuff. Great. But if you want a big kind of boom, boom, some guys and girls don't know how to do that. Um, yeah. Some people can make the snare absolutely ring, get a really even rim shot and just make that the most explosive snare ever. Some people just lay in and keep the stick on it and it's like, dish, dish. 
And they're all, all of those techniques are valid for a track. You know, a great drummer should know how to do all of those things. And yeah. just so much variation. It, it, it's crazy. Yeah. One, it's really some of those things where uh, an electronic kit, you just, it's yeah. unreasonable to expect a piece of electronics to respond like such a, again, a hollowed out log with an animal skin over it. Those are, yeah. you know, sort of polar opposites. So to expect one to respond like the other, it's yeah. getting closer every year. But um, all those things that, you know, you'd asked about a beginner on an, an electronic kit, the logistics overrule everything. It's better to learn on an electronic kit than to not play at all. Um, sure. But, you know, learning all those, um, all those fine motor skills that, you know, it's the same as picking things up with your fingers versus grabbing them with your claws, you know, yep. Uh, yep. you got to learn those things. Um, and it's, it's hard to do, but again, better to, better to plug the thing into the wall than to not play anything. So. Absolutely. Thanks ever so much. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. Have a great. One. Thank you. Let's go back to, to, uh, Miguel. Mike, thanks ever so much. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. These guys are so passionate about their instruments. I thought it was really cool to get them all involved and have them talk you through the stuff. Yeah, I like I I I love talking about things I know the least amount about. So of course the the drum section because I was saying uh, I don't know if you could hear our conversation, but I was saying as an engineer, I know you know this as an engineer, recording drums is like kind of the pinnacle. It's like the thing that we really pride ourselves on because you know, I know every engineer has a secret like, oh, I put the mic here and I do this and I use this compressor in this configuration. We love it with drums. There's so many things you can do to make drums sound different, make them interesting, make them your signature. And every player plays differently. So no matter how you set up the kit, it can be like almost starting again when a different drummer gets on. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I hope that was all helpful. It's great Very seeing you and talking to you as always. Good, good doing things a little, little differently this time and and you see yeah. the store and some of the other guys here and everything. Well, we're gonna we're still gonna come and fly in. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. We can come to the store and do some stuff, but then we can also go to your studio and, and track there as well. I think that would be amazing. May, maybe maybe have uh, um, some of these guys coming down and play as well. That'd be. I was thinking excellent. about that. We, we got our yeah. band here. Yeah, I think that sounds. That's gonna be a lot of fun. So, Mike, thanks ever so much. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, there'll be links to all of the gear that we. We're talking about down below and any other suggestions that the guys have. And uh, thanks again, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. So long. Farewell. La vida's au revoir. Adios.